I'm Matt Battersby and I study acting and theatre making at the London College of Music. Now we're in some strange and quite frankly scary times at the moment of coronavirus and self-isolation, the country's on lockdown and I wanted to see, seeing as we can't go into university and create incredible theatre, how much we really can do while we're at home in isolation. So this is a self-isolation reading of the importance of being earnest and essentially what's happened is everyone sent, well recorded their lines at home, sent them to me and I've edited them into what hopefully resembles the play. So I wanted to talk about why I chose the importance of being earnest for this project uh, just before we start and mainly, well a couple of reasons to be fair. One is we were doing an Oscar Wilde project, we were working on a dramatisation of The Picture of Dorian Gray before university closed down, so I kind of wanted to continue that theme. But also The Importance of Being Earnest is a play about who you are based on who you're with, and I think we all know that we change our ways based on who we're spending time with. And it's also a play about who we are, where we are, and where we go. So, at the moment, where we're with the same people almost every day, well every day, and you can't really go anywhere, there's nowhere to go, um, and you even face a fine for leaving the house too often, there's a really interesting idea today of who we have to be based on the people that we're forced to spend time with. And I think that's a really interesting parallel with the importance of being earnest. Now, hopefully you enjoy this and it's nowhere near perfect. Stage directions are read in by me to simulate action, uh, which isn't the greatest thing, but there's not a lot else we can do at the moment. You know, I can't get props and fireplaces to people around the country. So I hope you enjoy. Um, I will be hosting a Q&A session, so if you've got any questions that you would like answered based on acting to an invisible scene partner, or producing it, or directing it, anything at all, please drop them in the comments below, and I will try and answer as many as I possibly can um, in the Q&A video. Acts 2 and 3 will be coming very soon, we've already started work on both, and they're looking incredible. So this is Act 1 of The Importance of Being Earnest, where we meet the strange young fellows Jack and Arbinon, who are both quite pompous, I think, and I kind of both love them for it. Um, they're played by the incredible Chelsea Sheldon and Marianne Kelly. We also meet Lady Bracknell, uh, one of the, I think, one of the most incredible roles in the theatre, uh, played wonderfully by Max Bayford. We also have Gwendolyn, um, who is an interesting young lady with, strangely, for the time, a mind of her own and kind of goes against Victorian standards, played by Francesca Provini. And we also have the wonderful servant Lane, played by Siobhan Mary Jane. So uh, hopefully we will get Act 2 to you by next week and Act 3 to follow. And then maybe, fingers crossed, more plays coming your way whilst we're in these strange times. Sorry for waffling on, thank you for listening to me. But for now, <laughs> enjoy Act 1 of The Importance of Being Earnest. Act 1. Scene morning room in Arvinon's flat in Half Moon Street. The room is luxuriously and artistically furnished. The sound of a piano is heard in the adjoining room. Lane is arranging afternoon tea on the table and after the music has ceased, Arvinon enters. Did you hear what I was playing, Lane? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. But I play with wonderful expression. 
As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. And speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cooked for Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. Lane hands them on a salver. Algernon inspects them, takes two, and sits down on the sofa. Hmm. Oh, by the way, Lane, I see from your book that on Thursday night, when Lord Shoreham and Mr Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely a first-rate brand. Good heavens! Is marriage so demoralising as that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I have had very little experience of it myself up to the present. I've only, I've only been married once. That was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. I don't know that I'm much interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir. It is not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Very natural, I am sure. That'll do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane goes out. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem, as a class, to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Enter Lane. Mr Ernest Worthing. Enter Jack. Lane goes out. How are you, my dearest Ernest? What brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else would bring one up anywhere? Eating as usual, I see algae. I believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? In the country. Jack sits down on the sofa. And what on earth do you do there? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It's excessively boring. Jack pulls off his gloves. And who are the people you amuse? Neighbours. Neighbours. <laughs> Got nice neighbours in your part of Shropshire. Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. Algernon goes over and takes a sandwich. By the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Eh, uh, Shropshire? Yeah, of course. Oh, hello. Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who's coming to tea? Oh, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. <sighs> How perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well, but... I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. <laughs> I am in love with Gwendolyn. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you would come up for pleasure. I call that business. How utterly unromantic you are. I really don't see anything romantic in proposing. It is very romantic to be in love. But there is nothing romantic about a definite proposal. Why one may be accepted, one usually is, I believe. Then the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If I ever get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. I have no doubt of that, dear Algae. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. Oh, there is no use speculating on that subject. Divorces are made in heaven. Jack puts out his hand to take a sandwich. Algon at once interferes. Please 
don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. <laughs> well, you have been eating them all the time. Algernon takes one and eats it. <laughs> that is quite a different matter. She's my aunt. Algernon takes a plate from below. Have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. Jack advances to the table and helps himself. And very good bread and butter it is too. Well, my dear fellow, you need not eat as if you were going to eat at all. You behave as if you were married to her already. You are not married to her already, and I don't think you will ever be. Why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it right. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. It is a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Algernon rings the bell. Uh, Cecily? What on earth do you mean? What do you mean, Algie, by Cecily? I don't know anyone of the name Cecily. Enter Lane. Yes, sir. Bring me that cigarette case Mr Worthing left in the smoking room the last time you dined here. Lane goes out. Do you mean to say you have had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you had let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large sum. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. There's no good offering a large reward now that the thing is found. Enter Lane with a cigarette case on a salver. Algernon takes it at once. Lane goes out. I think it is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. Algernon opens the case and examines it. However, it makes no matter, for now that I look at the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't yours after all. Of course it's mine. Jack moves towards him. You have seen me with it a hundred times, and you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I am quite aware of the fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily, and you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes. Charming old lady she is too. Lives in Townbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, Algie. Algernon retreats to the back of the sofa. But why does she call herself Little Cecily if she's your aunt and lives at Tunbridge Wells? From Little Cecily with her fondest love. Jack moves to the sofa and kneels on it. <laughs> My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some ants are tall, some ants are not tall. That is a matter that surely an ant may be allowed to decide for herself. <laughs> you seem to think that every ant should be exactly like your ant. That is absurd. <laughs> for heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. Jack follows Algernon around the room. Yes, but why does your aunt call you her uncle? From little Cecily, with her fondest love, to her dear Uncle Jack. There is no objection. I admit to an aunt being a small aunt, but why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle? I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It is Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack.
you've always told me it was Ernest. And I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest looking person I ever saw in my life. It's perfectly absurd you're saying that your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here is one of them. Algernon takes a card. Mr Ernest Worthing, B4, The Albany. I'll keep this as a proof that your name is Ernest if you ever attempt to deny it to me, or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else. Algernon puts the card in his pocket. Well, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country and the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes. But that does not account for the fact your small Aunt Cecily, who lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle. <laughs> Come, old boy, you had much better have that thing out at once. My dear Algie, you talk as if you were a dentist. It is very vulgar to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. Well, that is exactly what dentists always do. Now go on, tell me the whole thing. I may mention that I have always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret Bunburyist, and I am quite sure of it now. Bunburyist? What on earth do you mean by a Bunburyist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to inform me why you are Ernest in town and Jack in the country. We'll produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Algernon hands Jack the case. Now produce your explanation, pray make it probable. Algernon sits on the sofa. <laughs> my dear fellow, there is nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it is perfectly ordinary. Old Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will Guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle, from motives of respect that you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country, under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You're not going to be invited. I may tell you candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have been buried all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now go on. Why are you earnest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Algie, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness. In order to get up to town, I've always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That, my dear Algie, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. <laughs> that wouldn't at all be a bad thing. Literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should leave that to the people who haven't been at at university. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you really are is a Bunburyist. I was quite right in saying you're a Bunburyist. You're one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest in order that you may be able to come to town as often as you like. I've invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury, in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis's tonight, 
for I've been really engaged at Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You are absurdly careless about sending out invitations. It's very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. You had better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. To begin with, I dine there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. In the second place, whenever I do dine there, I am always treated as a member of the family and sent down with either no woman at all or two. In the third place, I know perfectly well who she will be placed me next to tonight. She will place me next to Mary Farker, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. That is not very pleasant. Indeed, it's not even decent, and that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. They look so bad. It's simply washing one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunburying. I want to tell you the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too much interested in him. It is rather a bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest. And I strongly advise you do the same with Mr... with your invalid friend with the absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. And if you ever get married, which seems to be extremely problematic, you'll be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. That is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she is the only girl I ever saw in my life that I would marry, I certainly won't want to know a Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realise that in married life, three is company and uh, two is none. That, my dear friend, is the theory that the corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, and that the happy English home has proved in half the time. For heaven's sake, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. My dear fellow, it isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such a lot of beastly competition about. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that Wagnerian manner. Now, if I go get her out of the way for ten minutes, so that you may have an opportunity for proposing to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you tonight at Willis's? I suppose so. If you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate people who are not serious about meals. It is so shallow of them. Enter Lane. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Algernon goes forward to meet them. Enter Lady Bracknell and Gwendolyn. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you're behaving very well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Lady Bracknell sees Jack and bows to him with icy coolness. Dear me, you are smart. I'm always smart, aren't I, Mr Worthing? You're quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I, I hope I'm not that. It would leave no room for development, and I intend to develop in many directions. Gwendolyn and Jack sit down together in the corner. I'm sorry for a little late, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. <laughs> and now I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Algernon goes over to the tea table. Won't you come and sit here, Gwendolyn? Thanks, Mama. But I'm quite comfortable where I am. Algernon picks up an empty plate in horror. Good heavens!
Evans, Lane, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. There were no cucumbers at the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. <laughs> no cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane goes out. <laughs> I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers, not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its colour. From what cause, of course, I cannot say. Algernon crosses and hands tea. Thank you. I have quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I am going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. She is such a nice woman, and so attentive to her husband. It's a delight to watch them. I am afraid, Aunt Augusta, I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you all tonight, after all. I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your uncle would have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. It is a great bore, and I need hardly say a terrible disappointment to me. The fact is, I have just had a telegram say that my poor friend Bunbury is very ill again. Argonon exchanges glances with Jack. They seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange. This Mr Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes. Poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I must say, Algernon, that I think it is high time that Mr Bunbury made up his mind about whether or not he is going to live or die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd. Nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged by others. Health is the primary duty of life. I am always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice. As far as improvements in his ailment goes, anyway. I should be obliged if he would ask Mr Bunbury from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday for I rely you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and no one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season when everyone has practically said whatever they have had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. I'll speak to Bunbury, Aunt Augusta. If he is still conscious, and I think I can promise you he'll be all right by Saturday. Of course, the music is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I'll run over the programme I've drawn out, if you'll kindly come into the next room for a moment. Thank you, Algernon. This is very thoughtful of you. Lady Bracknell rises and follows Algernon. I'm sure the programme will be delightful, after a few exuberations. French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think that they are improper, and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language, and indeed I believe is so. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Mama. Lady Bracknell and Algernon go into the music room. Gwendolyn remains behind. Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr Worthing. When people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain they mean something else. And that makes me nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I'm never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any girl I have ever met since I met you. Yes, I'm quite aware of the fact. And I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, 
you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. Jack looks at her in amazement. We live, as I hope you know, Mr Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensely, expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my idea has always been to love someone with the name Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. But you don't mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. Yes, I know it is, but supposing it was something else. Do you mean to say you couldn't love me then? Ah, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life, as we know them. Personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care for the name of Ernest. I don't think the name suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It's a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. Well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say that I think there are lots of much nicer names. I think Jack, for instance, a charming name. Jack? No. There is very little music in the name Jack, if any at all. Indeed, it does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they have all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John, and I pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure, pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only really safe name is Ernest. Quindlin, I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. There is no time to be lost. Married, Mr Worthing? Well, surely. You know that I love you and you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you were not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity and to spare you any po possible disappointment, Mr Worthing, I think only f it is only fair to tell you that, quite frankly beforehand, I am fully determined to accept you. Gwendolen. Yes, Mr Worthing, what have you got to say to me? You know what I've got to say to you? Yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolen. Will you marry me? Jack goes on to his knees. Of course I will, darling. How long have you been about it? I'm afraid you've had very little experience of how to propose. My own one. I have never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but often men propose for practice. I know my, my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. What wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They're quite, quite blue. I hope you always look at me like that, especially when other people are present. Enter Lady Bracknell. Mr Worthing, rise, sir, from this semi-recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. Mama! Jack tries to rise. Gwendolyn restrains him. I must beg you to retire. There is no place for you. Besides, Mr Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I'm engaged to Mr Worthing, Mama. 
Jack and Gwendolyn rise together. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It is hardly a matter that she should be allowed to arrange for herself. And now, I have a few questions to put to you, Mr Worthing. While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn goes to the door. She and Jack blow kisses to each other behind Lady Bracknell's back. Lady Bracknell looks vaguely about, as if she could not understand what the noise was. She finally turns round. Gwendolyn, the carriage. Yes, Mama. Gwendolyn goes out, looking back at Jack. Lady Bracknell sits down. You can take a seat, Mr Worthing. Lady Bracknell looks in her pocket for notebook and pencil. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men, although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes. I must admit I smoke. Hmm. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of an opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? Jack hesitates. I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately in England, at any rate, education provides no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes, and would probably lead to acts of violence in Grubson Square. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. Lady Bracknell makes a note in her book. In land or in investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's life, and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one an position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course attached to it, about... 1,500 acres, I believe. But I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people who make anything of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? One four nine. The unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could be easily altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Well, I'm afraid I really have none. I am a, a liberal unionist. 
Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us. Or come in the evening, at any rate. Now, to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. Both? To lose one parent may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both seems like carelessness. Who is your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... Well, I was found. Found? The late Mr Thomas Cardew. An old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition. Found me. And gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. Where did this charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I was in a handbag. A somewhat large, black, leather handbag. With handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes. The Brighton line. The line is immaterial. Mr Worthing, I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion. Has probably indeed been used for that purpose before now. But it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognised position in good society. May I ask you then what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible, and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr Worthing. Lady Bracknell sweeps out in majestic indignation. Good morning. Algernon from the other room strikes up the wedding march. Jack looks perfectly furious and goes to the door. For goodness sake, don't play that ghastly tune, Algie. How idiotic you are. The music stops and Algernon enters cheerily. Didn't you go off all right, old boy? You don't mean to say Gwendolyn refused you. I know it is a way she has. She's always refusing people. I think it most ill-natured of her. Oh, Gwendolyn is as right as a trivet. As far as she is concerned, we are engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. 
Never met such a gorgon. I don't really know what a gorgon is like, but I am quite sure that Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she is a monster, <laughs> without being a myth, which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Elgie. I suppose I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, I love hearing my relations abused. It is the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't got the remotest knowledge of how to live. Nor the smallest instinct about when to die. <laughs> well, that is nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. This is exactly what things were originally made for. Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. You don't think there is any chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about 150 years, do you, Algy? All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does, and that is his. Is that clever? It is perfectly phrased, and quite as true as any observation civilised life should be. I am sick to death of cleverness. Everybody is clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The thing has become an absolute public nuisance. I wish to goodness we had few fools left. We have. I should extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? The fools. Oh, about the clever people, of course. <laughs> what fools? By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't quite the sort of thing one needs to tell a nice, sweet, refined girl. What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she's pretty, and to someone else if she is plain. Well, that is nonsense. And what about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, before the end of the week, I shall have got rid of him. I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, but it's hereditary, my dear fellow. It's a sort of thing that runs in families. You had much better say a severe chill. You are sure that a severe chill isn't hereditary? Or anything of that kind? Of course it isn't. Very well then. My poor brother Ernest is carried off suddenly in Paris by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. But I thought you said that Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in your poor brother Ernest. will not she feel his loss a good deal? Oh, well, that is all right. Cecily is not a silly romantic girl, I am glad to say. She's got a capital appetite, goes long walks and pays no attention to her lessons at all. I would rather like to see Cecily. I'll take very good care you never do. She is excessively pretty, and she is only just 18. And have you told Gwendolyn yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? Oh, one doesn't blurt these things out to people. Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything you like that half an hour after they have met, they will be calling each other sister. Women only do that if they have called each other a lot of other things first. Now, my dear boy, if we want to get a good table at Willis's, we really must go and dress. Do you know it is nearly seven? Oh, it is always nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. What should we do after dinner? Go to a theatre? Oh no, I loathe listening. Well, let us go to a club. Oh no, I hate talking. Well, we might trot round to the Empire at ten. 
Oh no, I can't bear to look at things. <laughs> it is so silly. Well, what shall we do then? Nothing. It's awfully hard work doing nothing. However, I don't mind hard work where there is no definite object of any kind. Enter Lane. Miss Fairfax. Enter Gwendolyn. Lane goes out. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Argie, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr Worthing. Really, Gwendolyn? I don't think I can allow this at all. Algie, you have always adopted a strict immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. Algernon retires to the fireplace. My own darling. Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we shall never. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. But although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else, and marry often, nothing she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Dear Gwendolyn. The story of your romantic origin, as related to me by Mama with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibres of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination, and simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Your town address at the Albany I have. What is your address at the country? The Manor House, Wilton, Hertfordshire. Algernon, who has been carefully listening, smiles to himself and writes the address on his shirt cuff, then picks up the railway guide. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. That, of course, will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. My own one. How long do you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algie, you may turn round now. Thanks. I've turned round already. You may also ring the bell. You will let me see you to your carriage, my own darling. Certainly. Lane enters. I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes, sir. Jack and Gwendolyn go off. Lane presents several letters on a salver to Algernon. It is surmised that they are bills, as Algernon, after looking at the envelope, tears them up. A glass of sherry, Lane? Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going bunburying. Yes, sir. I shall probably not be back till Monday. You could put up my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all the bunbury suits. Yes, sir. Lane hands Algernon a glass of sherry. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, you are a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. Enter Jack. Lane goes off. There's a sensible, intellectual girl. The only girl I ever cared for in my life. What on earth are you so amused at? <laughs> oh, I'm a little anxious about poor Bunbury, that is all. If you don't take care, your friend Bunbury will get you into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They're the only things that are never serious. <laughs> oh, that's nonsense. Algie, you never talk about anything but nonsense. <laughs> Nobody ever does. Jack looks indignantly at him and leaves the room. Algernon lights a cigarette, reads his shirt cuff, and smiles. End of Act One.